Welcome back to the Millionaire Choice Show. And today on the show, we're going to have uh, a little bit of a departure from my southern uh, accent. And we've got Dean Kelly from the UK, lives just outside of London. He is a serial entrepreneur, an angel investor. In uh, 30 years, he sold his first business in, for eight figures. And so, uh, you know, I always thought I was special because I was a millionaire by age 40. And then I started meeting people like Dean who did it by age 30. And then I didn't feel so special anymore. But it also gives us all hope to realize that, uh, you, you know, it's not some magic formula that anybody can do this thing. And, and I'm excited to hear, for you guys to hear Dean's story today. And so Dean's also uh, started mentoring and poaching uh, CEOs of other companies, uh, starting online uh, training too for the skill that he has. And I'm, I'll let him talk a little bit more about that as the show goes on. And then uh, has established the largest group of CEOs and recruiting companies in the UK. So that's, that's a big claim to be able to say, and a lot of influence there. Uh, Dean, welcome to the show. I'm eager to hear what you have to share with all the future millionaires. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, in, in, in terms of kind of covering my, my, my bio there. Um, yes, I did sell my first business uh, at 30 years old for an eight figure sum. Uh, it, it wasn't the intention to sell that early. It kind of came about. It was the fastest zero to exit recruitment company in the UK at the time. So it, it was about 2.8 years. So again, just you're thinking you've got this plan for 10 years. But I think at the time I thought I was going to be absorbed into a bigger company and that was going to be a springboard to do more things, which actually turned out to not be true. Um, it was a PLC, so a listed business. I then took over that business because it issued profit warnings within four weeks of acquiring my business. And I, at the same time, I become in, in the UK, the youngest CEO on the stock market, um, according to Motley Fool, which I, was a title I never wanted. Um, I can't say I enjoyed running a public company, but I did um, take it from a very a six, six and a half times over leveraged position. And you're, you're talking about when the crash was happening as well. So banks were very you know, harsh on businesses like that. Um, and I broke it up and I delisted it and I built it back up and I sold that again in 2015. So um, a bit of a baptism of fire. But yeah, I suppose early life, um, I came, came from council housing, social housing, had a strong family, um, grew up doing the things estate people do and kind of just hustling and, and wanting to be actually a professional sports person. I had, I had professional trials or I played with a professional football club for a little, little bit of time when I was younger in a school of excellence. I boxed, um, but I, I just wasn't good enough at either to, to make money at it. And um, at a point in time in my life, I think it was about 21, and my, my best friend and my cousin um, went to prison. And I just had this realisation, I'm, I'm different, even though I'm the same. I don't view things the way they do. And I don't want to be this you know, victim when I can be a victor. And, and, that, and that was a realization for me. So I sat down and wrote, wrote out my life plans. And, and you know, and I know you, you, you wrote your plans. I'm going to be a millionaire by us 40. And I just wanted these to be scary plans. And um, I did 10, 10 things. Um, I won't go through all of them. Some of them about getting married and children and things like that. But um, yeah, no, I put down, I'd be a millionaire by the time I'm 30. So it's kind of arbitrary. Yeah, millionaire by the time I'm 30, I'm 21. That seems a really long way away. I'll be fine. Um, the funniest one of all of them, though, was I only showed a friend, actually, about a few, three or four days after I'd put them together. I said, this is what I'm going to achieve. And number seven was, I will be invited to number 10 Downing Street by whoever the prime minister is when I'm 30 years old. And that didn't happen. It's the only one I didn't hit, but I did get invited to number 10 at 40 years old. So it was it was kind of that, that tick box thing. So, yeah, just just been through a journey, been through some sales, but baptism of fire. And I think my, my network of recruitment CEOs that I advise, uh, we're, we're knocking on about three billion of turnover if you put them together, but it's their money, not mine. But, it, but it's a great outfit and it's a great kind of into the human capital market across the world as well, because a lot of those businesses sell into the States um, because it's, it's, it's always looking for strong talent over there. Um, and and, it, and it's, it's given me a bit of a profile to invest in businesses as well. So I've got some amazing I've got a business called Sourcebreaker, which is uh, launching in America, which is doing phenomenally well in the UK with recruitment companies and aggregation, um, lots of AI. So, yeah, really, really, really on point with that sort of stuff. Yeah, so I'm, I'm kind of enjoying it. But I suppose the, the part you mentioned about training, I've um, mentored quite a few CEOs and, and entrepreneurs and founders and I've sat on boards. And I've helped turn businesses around. I've helped, helped travel profits in businesses. And I was, I was on, as I mentioned earlier, I was on Clubhouse a few weeks ago. And someone said to me, why don't you take that to the masses? So I said, what do you mean? We'll put it on a course, put it on video, put it on 
you know, you, you can only do so much one on one. So why don't you put a mask on? So that, that's that's my it's, it's been coined Deanism by by people I've worked with for many years. They say, oh, another Deanism. So we're going to call it that. And, and hopefully that's launching in March. Yeah. Well, I love the, the sound of that because you get to a point where you you have so much knowledge and you've been able to help so many people. You just need to be able to share it. And, you know, obviously that's what took me into the Internet back in the, you know, in the t- 2000s. I jumped from being an engineer and had worked on building my skills. I was just fascinated with the fact that you could take data uh, and plug it in, you know, here in Nashville, Tennessee, and someone somewhere across the state or the country or the city could pull that same data and information up. And, and I, when I saw that, I was just like, wow, that's amazing that you can do that. You don't have to pick up a phone. You don't have to, you know, you know, write a letter. You can just take data and information and move it across the country and share it with people. And that's what really got me studying internet and developing my skill sets and then led me to a guy uh, named Dave Ramsey's company when they were just growing their internet business and help them, uh, you know, really build up the whole digital transformation of the business. They were pretty much an offline business until then. And I got to have a good run there, but being able to share that wisdom, I think is huge and, and scalable. Like you're the internet allows you to scale and reach so many more people. Uh, and I, so I think your friends are got you right on, right on track with what they're doing. Well, I, I hope so. Um, and I enjoy it as well. I think that's the main thing. I can't do anything that I don't believe in or don't, I don't enjoy. Um, and when you when it's a funny thing when you're when you're when you're building a business and you're you're winning and things are going well and there's there's lots of accolades and awards and all these things they're, they're great. I don't think you ever get um, you know money money doesn't make you happy. It gives you choices. Um, you know you get a choice on holiday on a house on car. You know they'll, they'll all do the same thing, but you just you get that choice. And I think that's that's what money does for you. But the, but the feedback you get from legacy from people saying. Do you know what? I, I, I was mentored by that person or coached or advised and it changed my life. And, and that, I think, over the last decade of people adding testimonials and just actually to, last year, I bumped into somebody in the city of London that worked for me probably 15 years before. And I knew he'd started a business, just hadn't seen him in ages. And he walked past me. He said, Dean, how are you? And I was like, oh, God, you know, I haven't seen you in ages. How's your business going? And, so, and he, he introduced, he said, this is my managing director this chap and he said this is the guy I tell you about this is the guy he said one day I'm going to do the things you do he said you he said every morning I get up and I want to be like you I mean bear in mind I'm five for eight he was six four and I said (laughs) (laughs) I said you're gonna you're gonna have to you're gonna have to kneel down but he said no he's just said that that you know that focus that energy the way you helped people to be so much better every day Uh, I I've I've got three rules actually that's in the in the office of every business I've, I've owned and worked with and it's uh, it, it was for me in 1998. I couldn't I couldn't I don't know I don't know about you and but I, I struggled with KPIs saying right Dean make this many calls do this many you know uh, lead lead generations send this many CVs you'll get this many deals and I said well how, how do you know that well that's that's what on average you need to do and I said well I, I never came here to be average what do I, what do I need to do to not be average. You've got to do that first. And, then, and I, was, I was like, okay, so that troubled me. And I was on the tube on the way home from London. I thought, what, 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 what means something to me? So I come up with three things I thought incremental change I could use forever. And that was, I had to do something that made me feel uncomfortable. So I had to challenge myself every day. And I still do that. I find, you know, even, even if it's just exercise or, 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 or doing something with my brain, I've got to do something to challenge myself that makes me feel uncomfortable. I've got to make sure that I'm better than I was yesterday. And for that, you can have the worst day in the world, but I've got to learn something. So I, I might learn a new word or a new term or find something on the internet. Because I've got to feel like I've added to my skills and added to my knowledge every day. And the final thing, which is the, is the main thing, was when you finish, can you go home proud? And if you've had a really tough day and all your deals have fallen out and everything's gone wrong and whatever else, if you've done everything in your power, to change that day to make it positive then then just close the door and leave it there and go right I'm going to get up in the morning and go through my three steps again because it will it will slowly get better and I think that's that's the thing I've instilled in everybody that's worked with me and for me and I didn't really realize that until you know t- t- nearly two decades on people I'm now seeing have got their own businesses and done, gone on and done well and I've always supported them in that actually even even when they work with me I've always given them advice because I love it I love that entrepreneurial spirit to go off and do it again and replicate I did it you did it. We all do it. We all, we all got kind of information through nurture that um, we went off and, and we made better and, and we did something with it. So that's the, that's the bit that's resonated with me the most in my business life recently is that when, when you get that feedback, 
that counts more than the money and more than everything else, that feedback that actually you've improved somebody else's life. Yeah, I love what you're saying there. So you said a whole lot and there was a lot of wisdom wrapped up in that. Let's see if we can take those three and make them clear one more time because you got to repeat it so people get it, right? So summarize those three items again. So challenge yourself. So there's a book I read many years ago called Eat the Frog. And what it, what it says is, essentially, without going into all, all the depths, is if you do the hardest thing straight away that you've got to do that day, unless it's time that you have to do it at a certain time, if you can do it straight away in the morning, and they call that eating your frog. If every day you had to eat a frog and that was the worst thing you've got to do, don't leave it till lunchtime or the afternoon because, because you know in the back of your mind that that's something horrible you've got to do. And it affects everything else you do. So challenge yourself. Take on that tough task straight away. Get it out of the way and your day's free. You feel good. Whether I prefer to have a no than a maybe because a maybe sits on my shoulder and causes me to drag my heels and think about something that's, that's, that's basically a time thief and it's taking my mental my mental space so as long as you can challenge yourself find something that's going to improve you is going to make you better is going to really put you on the spot because i tell you what in, in nine, nine times out of ten you'll find it was never as bad as you think it is it's not the problem but you you've just got better and i think that's the thing and that's where they kind of all lead into each other and the second one is be better than you were yesterday so some days you will challenge yourself um, and you, you, you will make yourself feel uncomfortable, but you, you might not have improved outcomes for that day or that, that week or whatever it might be. And things might be, be tough and you might be firefighting, but then you've got to learn something that maybe might not be in the remit that you're trying to address at that point in time. And I used to keep this huge, um, obscure words dictionary in my, my first business and if people had a bad day, I say, right, okay, you bet. No, I'm not better than yesterday, Dean. I've had these deals fall out and this isn't the world's caving in. Right, okay. Do you understand what that word means? No. Okay, well, let's read it. Let's have a look. Okay, do you understand what that word means? Yes, repeat it back to me. Okay, you are now better than you were yesterday because you've learned something. And that was that, even if it's small, and I think for me, it's not so much that that suddenly made them a millionaire, it gives them that mindset that as long as I'm learning and improving that correlation between opportunity, um, you know, op op opportunity meets preparation because you're preparing by understanding things equals luck. Right. And, that, and that's the thing because opportunity passes you by every single day, but unless you prepared yourself to be sensitive and have that on your radar and pick things up and do that correlation, you don't get what other people call lucky. Um, and as they say, the, what's the saying is the hard, hard, harder I work, the luckier I get. Um, and, that, and that's, that's, that's a nice one. But yeah, the, fi the final one is if you go home and you haven't done anything and, and you haven't done what you should do, this is more the, the, the kind of entrepreneurial guilt. It starts to affect your home life and it starts to affect your outer life. And I'm not a fan of work-life balance because I don't, I don't think you need to balance them. Um, life is a balance. You're always, you know, you're always jotting from one side to the other. You just need to make sure that they all entwine well. It, it, it doesn't have that impact so it's, you know you've got a big family you don't want to go home and that that be an issue on, with them because you're you're still stuck in the office in your brain so have you done everything if you go go home proud be proud of what you've done pat yourself on the back because you you gave it your best shot and for me that was easy yes we have kpis in our businesses yes we have targets but i always used to say to people if you can measure yourself by that every day you'd have, you'd have hit your kpis you'd have done everything you need to do and, and you'll be happy as well. Yeah, I love the principles there. And what I love about that is, you know, when I think about myself, you said KPIs earlier and like measuring yourself according to KPIs. Yes, you can do that to some degree. I can think of a couple of different ways to do that. I know people that have said, uh, you know, read a book a month. And I've met some guys who read a book every week. And so they read 52 books a year. That's not me. Um, but what I love what you said, it, it's it's a principle of really building a foundation and then constantly over time, you know, stacking one good block on top of another until you reach kind of like a, a height, a great height. And I think that's the direction. It's getting your time, your resources, your mind, like everything that you have as a, a, an asset, you know, flowing in the right direction as opposed to flowing to Netflix. Yeah. You know, and, and, you know, here in the States, I, when I wrote my book, you know, the average people have heard me quote this before, but it's like the average American watches 120 hours of television a month it's 30 hours a week. 
And mm-hmm. uh, and I've got a confession to make. I'm a little bit of a, a gaming addict and, and picked that up in my 20s and have constantly battled with it. And, you know, I've gone through seasons where I've played games, not played games, played games, not played games. And uh, and it just when I count up the number of hours, it's embarrassing to think of how many hours I've put into that. But still, because uh, following the principles you're talking about at times in my life, I was still able to reach a certain level of success. I just kind of regret that I probably could have reached a higher level of success yeah. if I had done even you know better or stayed more focused like you have. Yeah, it's it's a tough one. I'm not I'm not massive on TV, as my my children tell me. I'm the only parent they know that doesn't game. Um, I'm just rubbish at it. But but <laughs> my addiction was was sport um, when I was younger. Um, I was actually the second person in Britain to be treated for overtraining syndrome when I was uh, in my early twenties because. It, it was never enough. And going back to your gaming, um, for me, when you've got an entrepreneurial mindset, you're kind of all or nothing. So when you do game, you're probably doing far too much and then you have to stop and you have to go cold turkey and you have to do something else. And I'm like that in life. My wife's like, when you, when you get fixated on something, you're just like this. And in other things, you're just like that. Well, you know, no interest whatsoever. And I think that's, that's the danger that we, we have these obsessive compulsive kind of, behaviors and, and we, we just get hooked on anything um, and we have to be really careful about what those things are i totally agree with you and i'm kind of right now i'm going through a phase of unplugging and uh and you know i'm still my business is still startup so i wouldn't say i've reached this level of success that i had in my former you know corporate career and so 15 years in the corporate world building up you know a position and then now i'm you know kind of starting over and you're going okay i take what i learned from that apply it to this but the focus is different because you go from a job mindset, which is what you did, even at the corporate level, you're still, you know, working for somebody else and certain things are dictated to you that have to be delivered. But in the entrepreneurial world, you know, you're responsible for yourself every day, totally different mindset, totally different agenda every day when you wake up and, uh, you know, everything's on you. If you don't get it done, then, uh, you know, it doesn't get done. <laughs> I don't know about you. I quite like that. Um, I, 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 I've always been, my wife's like, well, why do, why do you have to keep doing these things? And, and I like the challenge. I like the danger. I hate being comfortable. Um, and I don't mean that in a financial sense. I don't, I find if, if, if I've not got something that's, that I've got to really work and push and inspire people that work with me and find, and, I, and everything I've done has been disruptive. It's always been different to what everybody else has done. Um, because I've always wanted to cut my own path and I don't conform very well but when that when like, I suppose you're going back to selling you know selling businesses sold sold a few businesses when when that moment happens and you get you get money and, it, and if, to the outside world that's the best thing in the world but you kind of feel like the wind's been taken out yourselves um, especially my first business as, as I said it's great to have the tagline of the fastest exit and this is 30 years old but I was having a really good time and really enjoying myself and and actually, the money didn't didn't change a lot in terms of I still still loved going to work, still loved what I did, but it wasn't all mine anymore. And uh, I did a talk for LinkedIn in London quite a few years ago, and, and that was one of the questions I was asked: What did it feel like when you made this money at thirty years old, and you come from the background you come from? You know, you're a young CEO on the on the stock market. I said for about for about half an hour, it was it was a real buzz. I said, and then, then I kind of thought, well, does that change my life? I was financially quite, quite secure at the time anyway. Um, I went in on to, to my office on a Monday morning, saw all my staff. I actually sat at my, sat at my desk and felt a little bit sick um, because it, it, it kind of dawned on me that it wasn't necessarily the money I was doing it for. I was doing it for the, the enjoyment, for legacy, for impact, because that, I had a passion and a, a belief, uh, again, going back to the businesses I'm doing now, very similar to my passion and belief then. I'm trying to redo that again now. Um, not everybody, from the outside, people think sometimes when you've got that kind of vision and passion and belief, you're doing it for the money. Um, I think sometimes when, when you have that, that, that passion and belief, money's just, it's just a byproduct. It happens. If you're very good at something, people are going to pay to have you in, that, in their circle, to do things for them, to do the things they can't do and and that just happens and and it, and it happened to me and it's happened a couple of times um but I enjoyed the journey 
people say well, I want to sell a company or that's that's great some people do want to just do that and take time out and that's fantastic um for me I don't play golf <laughs> I don't I don't I have no real additional hobbies outside of my family and still doing a bit of boxing and stuff but um yeah I, I, I love work I love I love I love the challenge every single day and as long as I've got a purpose and I think I can do better for for me the world my family and everyone else I'll just get up and I'll do that yeah. And I love your principles, the three, and one of them, you know, your rings true is you like to be uncomfortable. Right. And so when I think about my own life, um, I went to school for engineering, did engineering, but very shortly got into computers going, Hey, I need to learn about computers. You know, this was like, it sounds like so long ago. I'm, I, I, I guess I'm getting up in years, but you know, back in 1996, uh, you know, windows was at 3.11. You didn't even have windows 95 yet. Right. And, uh, and so I started learning about computers and that was uncomfortable, but I became the best computer guy at the company. And mm. then from that, I became an internet guy and that was uncomfortable. And, you know, when I asked my wife, I told her I needed to spend a thousand dollars on some database software and she didn't even know what database was. And, you know, and we're, uh, you know, newly married, got a house and she's like, okay, let's do it. And, uh, and then I learned how to program and then change jobs, scared to death. Cause I'm like, well, I don't even know if I can do this internet job that I'm applying for here, but I'm going to go for it. And man, did that was just quite like a crazy ride, you know? And I found myself in charge of a hundred people leading 20% of the company staff, you know, with 500 people and building up this digital business where we were doing, you know, 70, 80% of the company's revenue coming in through the, through digital. Those were all uncomfortable things, but they, what allowed me to get there is like you said earlier, uh, be better today than you were yesterday. Right. And that's this whole concept of constantly investing in yourself. And, and I love, uh, I had a guy named Jeremy Newsom on the show a few weeks ago. And uh, for you future millionaires listening, if you haven't heard the episode with Jeremy on it, you need to go listen to that. I'm texting Jeremy. Uh, I try not to text him every day now that I've had him on the show, but I text him quite a bit. And uh, he talked about how he invests his money. And he said 9% of his money that he spends, he actually is investing in himself and the personal growth. And so 90% of his money, he invests in the stock market, 9% into himself, and then 1% into like real estate. Now, I don't agree necessarily with that breakdown of investment strategies, but I thought was what significant about that was, was how much he invested back into himself of his own money that he spends each year. And, uh, and I think that's where you're going to get your best dividends, right? Dean, your, your pay, you know, invest in yourself because that's going to be what pays you the most over the long haul. Absolutely. And, and it's going to give you the most joy, you know, when, when you when you build a share portfolio, unless you're, unless you're a trader and that's your job, but a share portfolio, a real estate portfolio, you know, they're, they're objects that are going to give you some passive income and whatever else. And, and that's great if, if, that's, if that's what you want to do and that's security and that feels nice. But you're not necessarily going to get that fulfillment in you improving. And, and I think the thing is, evolution just sets that sets that trend and that momentum going that human beings have just been evolving for so long and there's a lot there's a lot there now to like netflix that might slow that evolution and make us a little bit less active and 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 it really will separate um you know those entrepreneurs from the nearly entrepreneurs, the people who thought about i bet i bet i bet you've met hundreds of people when you say to them about like, they go yeah i had a really good idea and the difference between having a really good idea and an entrepreneur who made a lot of money is purely execution. They went ahead and did it. And, you know, and, 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 and that's the thing. And I think we, if you're going to go and do that, there's always going to be those people who evolve. You always want to be learning. And so I invest a lot of time in myself. I read a lot of books. Um, I do do a few audio books. I've generally got three books on the go at once um, just, just because I get bored quickly. So I get halfway through and I have to start another one. I have to start another one. I read contrarian books to other people. Um, a phenomenal book I, I, I will recommend because it's a, a book about the US um, is a book called The Puritan Gift. And I haven't heard of it. It's, it's, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. Um, I think it's Hopper and Hopper. It, I, I read it quite a few years ago and it's essentially is, you know, for the Puritans and, and the Quakers that, that went over to the US many, many years ago and about how, you know, within those communities, they, they, they grew enterprise. And that enterprise from lending to somebody of the same community to you and working together to build businesses because they had to, because they had nothing else. And, and how that grew into this engine that become America and America become the biggest power in the world. And, 
um, you know, after the war, we, we built Japan with its, its business knowledge and stuff like that. For me, it's, it's a great history book, but it's also, it's a real phenomenal book on management. Um, and if, if I, when, when I'm doing the normal kind of, uh, I suppose, clubhouse, what's, people ask me, what's your, what's your favorite book? And I'll, I'll, I'll give them two or three books. And that's in there as my top three. Um, and they've never heard of it. And the thing is, because they're reading Stephen Covey, they're reading self-help books, they're reading the stuff that everybody else is reading. And for me, a little bit, if everybody's doing that, then everybody's the same. So what are you going to do to transcend your peers? What are you going to do to make you feel? Because that's comfortable. If you're going to do my, my seven steps of being highly effective, whatever they might be, I'm pretty much doing what everybody else is doing. So am I making myself feel uncomfortable? Am I challenging myself? No, because I'm not doing anything different. Why don't I read? Some, something contrarian and then I've got information on both sides and I can make an informed decision and that's that's been the difference I think and that's that's the impact you can have on yourself because you can think wider about stuff and not be not be pushed by mainstream media or just because you're biased to a certain type of book or whatever else I like sometimes I, read, I pick up books and I think that's completely the opposite to how I think I'll start reading it might get halfway through and think I, I just can't digest it but I gave it a go and 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 I've learned something I might have learned that it's just, it is completely wrong, but I've, I've learned something. And I think that investment in yourself is great because it, it gives you that knowledge and gives you more opportunity from it. Yeah, and I think uh, a lot of people, when I talk to them about reading books, and I'm probably not the most prolific reader, what I've seen in my life is I'll go through phases where I'll read for a while. And then, you know, after, uh, I think after kid number three, for you guys listening, I've got six children. So that's what Dean was referring to. And uh, we stay a bit busy, but I saw my patterns change. You know, I was doing a lot of self-growth, a lot of self-development, probably until, you know, kid number three, after kid number three, going on kid number four, somewhere around there. And then I, you know, your time gets kind of taken away from you a little bit more and you have to, you know, be more structured, more rigid if you want to keep up that growth pace. And, and uh, I love when the kids start coming. There's a, a thing you don't do in my house and you don't come to me and tell me why you didn't do something or that you couldn't do it. And the first words out of my mouth were the first things that I heard when I got my first job out of college, which was don't make excuses. Mm. And, uh, you know, there, there, sometimes you can make reasons. There are reasons why you couldn't do something, but don't make an excuse. People, and this is what I tell my wife, I tell myself, which is you always find time to do the things you want to do. You just have to make sure you want to do the right things. Mm. And that's the big, the big thing. And that's what I try to teach my kids. And, that's not an easy thing to teach six kids. <laughs> it's not. No, uh, my, my three rules are, are, are literally pasted on my fridge and I have been there for a few years now. That's so wonderful. Kids get that. Just, just to kind of echo what you were just saying there, the, the other thing that's in all of my businesses, and for anybody who's, who's working with me who sees this, they'll be nodding their head and rolling their eyes, but I, I ban the word try. Try doesn't exist in my business. If you come to me and you're meant to be closing a deal or you're meant to be doing something, the first thing anybody says to you, I say, what, what happened? Well, I tried. No, no, no. You did or you didn't. Right. Well, I didn't. Right. Okay. Why didn't you? And it cuts out a good 20, 30% of a meeting because everybody's telling you what they did and the effort. But I just want to know why, because that, that objection is just an instruction on how to get around it. Let's deal with that because been out of short trousers a long time. We can take our medicine and get on with it. We all make mistakes, but let's just, let's just do this and get it done and we can deal with that issue. So I ban the word try and make sure that, you know, yes, it slips into conversation and I, I go, right. And, they, and there's, yeah, fine. But I tell you what, it gets things done faster and more effectively and stops people with, you know, with, with, with those excuses because try is always in an excuse. You know, I tried to do this. I tried to do that. Oh, I, try, I tried to make time. Hey, you did. Yeah, I, I, what I love about that is it, it's something that I've tried to figure out how to do better, even with my marriage or people I work with is clarity, right? And I think by taking try out and going, okay, you either did or you didn't, there's no excuses, there's reasons, but there's no excuses. And you always find time to do the things you want, you need, you want to do. So you just have to make sure you're with my kids. Like, uh, I didn't get my paper done. I got an F, I got a D. I'm like, kids, like, I know you and you're not an F or a D student. You're not even C students. You guys are A, B students. Like, if you bring me a C, D, or F, like I know what you're capable of. So don't make an excuse to me on why you got a C, D, or F on anything because I know how smart I am and I know how smart you are. And therefore, it's pretty easy for me to figure out that you just didn't do your best work. So that don't give me an excuse. Now, why didn't you do your, your best work? 
Well, I tried. I love what you're saying there, but the you you cut through the clutter and you get straight to the point and the meat and the black and white and and it brings tremendous clarity. And I see that in my home, but I also see that in my work life, my professional life. Um, and I I hate to say this, but I have a client. I guess I'm going to tell a little bit, but uh, I felt like I had the same conversation with a client around a decision we were making, and and I got to him and I said, you know, we we've had this conversation six times, and I don't want to have it a seventh time. And I'm like, I'm just like, I've got to be blunt. You know, this, we're either in or we're out. We've had it six times. We're going to, this is it. And uh, that was tremendous clarity. And from that point on, we were able to move forward like we needed to move forward with the project we're on. So um, I love your principles. I, th- I, th- I think you've got to be like that. I mean, I'm, you know, it's not like I'm uncaring or anything, but I just, I just don't, I don't, in, in my life, I've not got time for that it, it, peripheral stuff. And, and it doesn't really help anybody. If, if if somebody's having a really hard time and they need they need an arm around them, yeah, of course, you know, I'll I'll do that. But I like to to get, just get to the crux of everything quickly because my biggest skill in business has always been I'm a problem solver. So, you know, I'll start a business, got a vision, but I'm always trying to fix something. I'm always trying to remove a pain um, and leave leave a gain. And to do that, you've got to think of things in a very you can't waste time you've got you've got to really be able to map it out break it down take it to the lowest denominator and say right if i do that what's the what's the ripple impact on that what am i going to get out of that so it's my processes so i get to the heart of something then i work out my processes then then we follow those processes which we may need to pivot or covid happened you pivot um but unless you're on top of those processes you can't do that so quickly because you go right okay the market's changed uh oh, where are we who's doing what what you can't be like that people need to know they're accountable and they need to know that when they're there and they're doing something they're present and they've turned up and if everybody does that you'll be fine you know we, it, it doesn't need you don't need an hour drawn out drawn out meeting to talk about something that we could have dealt with in, in two or three minutes um so that's always always been my way my wife again you know she's she's i'm not she sounds like a critic but she's not she just tries to keep me balanced but um, she says sometimes, oh, you talk to the children like you're a sergeant major. I said, no, I don't. I just don't. I've got, the, I've got, I don't know about you, but I've got two boys and a girl. But my boys, if I give them any grey, they'll take it, you know. Um, and and that, because, because boys are like that, it's, it's black or white, right? My wife would say, how can I go on the PlayStation? And she'll say, well, okay, but you've got to do your homework first. Oh, okay, look, half an hour on the PlayStation, then do your homework. Me, no, there's no, they wouldn't even ask me because I okay, go, you do your homework nothing else exists until you've done your homework. And then when they've, when they've done half an hour on the PlayStation, my well, wife will end up in an argument with them because they've not done their homework. So I think in life, you know, if you can structure yourself and going back to, to something you said earlier about working out you know, what, what you do and where your priorities are, that's, that's again something I've been very good at is I look at everything in my life and I prioritise it. And when I have to make a decision, so when I run this network, a lot of the time we do events and speakers and I host uh, 30, 40 CEOs and we talk about private equity and exiting businesses, raising capital, whatever it might be. Um, and I work with, but, but afterwards, because they've come from all over the UK and some come from places like Amsterdam and, and Paris and whatever else, we, they'll want to drink because they're staying in hotels and we'll get together in a congress. And, and I will stop and I will, I will speak to people, but, but I'm, you know, I'm not a big drinker anyway, um, but I won't drink because I know I get up at 4.30 every morning to go in the gym so I don't encroach on my family time. And I will look at it, and, it, and depending on what I've got on the next day, if it's a priority, if that ranks one above the other, I always do what's the highest ranking priority. And so that generally means I cut some of that socialising out because I know I want to be on form the next day. And I feel happy with that because I'm a, I'm a dad first, husband second, health freak th- uh, third, and I'm a businessman fourth. But they're all together, they're not mutually exclusive. So um it, that that's generally and as long as my priorities are in that order that my children and you know my family come first and being a good husband and being present and making sure that I, I give quality time there my health because if I haven't got my health that's no good for my family or my wife anyway um and then and in the business and I think if you if you get those things in the right priority you'll, you'll be happy your, your levels of success I think sometimes it's nice to have some financial security and be a millionaire and be a multi-millionaire um but if, you're, if your end goal is just money, you're probably not going to get to where you need to be because you're going to be unhappy in other parts of your life. And you don't want to be that 80 year old who's super, super rich. Um, and you're just sat there thinking, what have, what have I given back? What have I done? What have I left? 
as a legacy. So yeah, I just make sure I prioritize everything. Yeah. I love how you said that. I wish I, ha- I wish I could say that I had, uh, you know, I would say I, I mentally knew that like they, they should be in that order, but I don't know that I, I, well, my wife would tell you, I did not live it out that way. <laughs> and I've been working on that really hard the last four years. You know, I've been married uh, 22 years now. I think this is 23 coming up in October. And, uh, but you know, confession time, right? I'm, uh, you know, 18 years of that was not good for my wife. It was, you know, maybe the first few years were good and then it, it was not good, but she hung in there and, and I hung in there and, but I had to put the effort in, you know, I had to go, you know what, either this is going to get worse or it's going to get better and I need to make it better. And, uh, and I took a, it's taken a lot of work, but I would tell you today, you know, our marriage is the best it's ever been and probably better than what I envisioned when we first got married. So, um, but it took work. Right. And it, you know, I wish I had had it prioritized like you did at the top at my list. I thought I did, yeah. but you know, 18 years in, I'm like, Ugh, I didn't really know what that meant. It's, it's tough. I can't say that I've always, that's always been my aim. I can't say that I got it right in the beginning. I've been married. I'll be, I'll, I'll be 22 years this September. So similar, similar sort of time, uh, and got married quite young. So, you know, I was married at 25. My wife was 22 coming up to 23 so it, we, were, we were both very young for our peer group and I was I was on that trajectory at work I was one of the biggest billing recruitment consultants in the UK I would set up a business for someone else it's gone phenomenally well but that absorbed you know six six and thirty in the morning to nine at night I was there working 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 because we've got family we want to start a family we want to do these things and I went off and did it myself and all of that time I think when I look back Yes, my wife afforded me the time to do that. You know, it was all those other things in life that, 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 that generally would drag from your time she was taking care of. But, but although I wanted to put her first and then we had a first child and second child first, and that was my, my key result, that I needed to do that. And my objective was to make sure that we, we made sure that we had financial security and I looked after them so they were kind of in time with the business. I was probably, yeah, I would definitely far too much working and and I think lockdowns actually show me especially um that you can be there but not be present because your mind's somewhere else and and so you're not giving quality time and I think lockdown one over here we've had two big lockdowns the first one in March that that gave some clarity on that that actually I was around but I probably wasn't you know there is as, as much in in person as I should have been so it takes a while I think you know we're both of us in some sort of age and, and marriage time and I think when you get older, you can see it easier. You can look back. You can you can do what was good. What you know? How much of your time do you spend looking back at your career and saying, right, okay, that was a mistake. That was good. I could have done that better. That's how you learn, you know, from your mistakes. So yeah, I've, I've got. I, I think I've I've got it as as well balanced as I've ever had it, and that's good. And and I you know like everything I do, I will make it better because I, I'm just one of those people who wants to be better every single day than I was yesterday. So yeah. it will grow. Yeah, I love that. And I think uh, what resonated with me when you said that and what the principle that came to mind there is um, you're going to make mistakes along the way, right? You're going to learn from both the good things you do and the bad things you do. But the principle of both business and your marriage and your life is don't quit, right? So if you can get through the hard times, uh, whether that's in a business or whether that's in your marriage, you know, you can, it's those good and bad times that you have to learn from that you keep learning from and then you keep committing to go, you know what? this is rough but on the other side of it if I put enough effort in and enough work and I make the right choices and do the right things it's going to get better you know and I'll I'll just be real transparent with you um you know our our marriage was probably as bad as it could have gotten like it it probably could have gotten a little bit worse but it was pretty bad you know it was it was bad and uh you know my wife had kind of lost hope and was just going through the motions and I lost hope and was going through the motions but then I'm like you know what it's either going to get worse or it's going to get better. And I'm going to, from this day forward, I'm going to do whatever I can to make it better because I'm going to do my part. I don't know what my wife's going to do, but I'm going to do my part. And because I did my part, she was eventually able to do her part. And, and that's where we've gotten back to a really good place today. But let's turn a corner real quick, Dean. Uh, before we got on the show, we were talking about business. And I, I don't think I've mentioned this on the show before, future millionaires that are listening out there. But I've been, you know, lear- thinking more, just learning, like, how do you really like, turn the world's finances upside down. And so I don't want to be just another white financial guy doing a podcast. There's plenty of those guys. And they're all saying pretty much the same thing, right? 
So I, I just really want to be the guy that comes in and, and goes, how do we really change, fundamentally change things? You know, 78% of people are living paycheck to paycheck today. Dave Ramsey's been out there for 30 years, and I think the statistics are still the same. Uh, they haven't changed. He, he's helped millions of people. Uh, Tony Robbins, uh, David Bach, uh, Larry Burkett. You know, the, the list is a very long list of people that have done some really good work. But the statistics still haven't changed. And, you know, in the U.S., 40 percent of the world's millionaires live in the United States, um, which is a huge number. It's pretty crazy. But, you know, the U.S. is the place uh, where if you want to get wealthy, there's the biggest opportunity there per capita. Um, but the, the principle I want to talk about, Dean, is something you said earlier, which is you said you reinvest a lot of your money into business. And I think that's really a, a good thing, because as I'm processing, like how wealth is built, I think of, you know, stocks and bonds and all that is, is what I would call paper wealth and cash. And what can happen to paper? Well, paper can burn. And so I think that kind of wealth building is more of a tool. And what I've started to think about more, even in my own life, is that you can use paper wealth to, to build wealth, but you need to transfer it. You need to transfer it into something that's more tangible. And what I've come up with uh, philosophically is, uh, you know, gold and silver, um, land, real estate, right? Because those are tangible assets. And, you know, just recently, I don't know if you've seen this article, but Bill Gates is now the largest farmland owner, private farmland owner in the United States with 250,000 acres. So what's his software guy who's into vaccines and why is he buying up all this farmland? And it's because that's real, that's real wealth. That's transferable. It stays, you know, you have an asset, whether or not the stock market goes up or down, whether a company disappears or stays. It's real wealth. And then small business. I think those are the three that I've, you know, where I'm at right now is where it's like, oh, those are all real tangible wealth and a personal asset, you know, portfolio. And, and I thought it was interesting that you've put most of your money, you said, into developing small businesses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have. Um, I mean, go, going to Bill Gates, I think Bill Gates buying land because pushing genetically modified beef and you know, he's, he's, he's obviously not a stupid man and, and he wants dominant control of anything he touches. But and that's what's made him successful. You know, he was um, I, I was saying to someone the other day, actually, that in this cancel culture where people are being tear, torn down for the things they say. If you went back to, you know, like, you know, the 80s and 90s when Bill and Steve Jobs were, you know, really, really grabbing the world of their tech, their management styles and the way they dealt with people probably wouldn't have gone down that well today you know so th every everything evolves in terms of what and I think that's why they've evolved well Bill Gates has evolved in doing other things outside of his his normal remit but um, my, my investment into small business is that I understand it um, I've I've advised and coached a lot of businesses I've set up several I've built them I've sold them um, I've created value for people uh, I, I work a lot in education in the UK um, I have helped schools and groups of schools and local education authorities save millions and millions and millions of pounds. Um, but for me, that's the, that it goes back to the front line that has impact on children. So everything I've done has, has a purpose where I've started my own businesses. And I've got, I've, going back to your, your, your finances as well, the only time I've really lost a significant amount of money by getting it wrong was when I, when I, when I sold... Uh, my original business and in 2007 I switched to, to my wealth managers to be in UBS United Bank of Switzerland known for their, their being you know on the money and making things great um, obviously the crash happened but they were so off the mark with some of their things their hedge funds and um, so it's just 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 some of their their, their, their their property portfolios and stuff and I've still got loads that's illiquid with them that many years on and after that experience I thought do you know what I, I get more return from my own money being in things I can control and I think we said it at the beginning that when it's on you if you get it wrong you can only you can only look in a mirror and say right you you, you messed that up um, rather than listen to a, a wealth manager saying to you you know I, I, it wasn't me it was the market or whatever else well I get that and I do I do have lots of stocks and shares and investments and, and, and stuff like that as well because that's that's a safety foundation of spread assets and whatever but if i'm going to put a lot of time and effort into something and money i want to also be able to affect change on it as well and i think that's that's where it's come from um 
I just, I just enjoy the, I think the thing is when I ran a PLC, I went from running a high growth business that was, you know, the talk, talk of the town at the time to being on a board with institutional investors, being wheeled out to see people. And I realized that I've gone from being an entrepreneur and a salesperson, a blue sky thinker and a thought leader to an accountant. Mm. And that wasn't me. And I didn't like it. And I didn't like sitting in front of a, a you know, an investment fund saying, and they've asked me questions, which in all honesty, I can't answer because it was a closed period or it was this or that, you know, and, and they just want to see the whites of your eyes and I'm paying for this kind of service. And so I just said to myself afterwards, you know, if I do anything with business, it's not, I'd never be a PLC again. Um, I want to make sure that I'm always on the business, but in the business as well. I understand it from the bottom up and I just enjoy it. I enjoy business. I enjoy people. Hence why, why taking some of my methodology, methodologies um, into a training course and videos, we do masterclasses. Um, I've, I've, again, in my, my, my history, I've made 18 liquid millionaires, right? By training them in, in, in the things that I know and the things that I've done. They've, they've got big businesses. Some of those are multimillionaires. They've done, they've done phenomenally well. I can't say it's all me because obviously they've got to put in the effort. They've got to execute and whatever else. But I think that little bit of guidance from the things that I've learned over that period of time, I, I get, I get a lot of payback from that. And, and that's why I like being involved in business and I will put my money into business. I'll invest in, like I was just saying to you earlier about uh, Sourcebreaker, phenomenal business. I think it's got a valuation of 50, 60 million at the moment, SaaS business. Um, when I invested in that business, I, I met the CEO, he reached out to me, he had a spreadsheet, nothing else. He explained his vision to me. We sat in this members club in London, had a coffee, had a chat. He was highly intelligent, but, but not academically intelligent, just switched on. He just got it, got everything. And I was like, I, when he left, I thought, I'm going to invest in him. Even if I lose my money, he's someone that I could work with. I've been, an, I've been a non-executive director for him for, for, for some time, been on his board. Um, but he's someone I can work with, but I, I would just love to be part of that growth. So you can't get that out of big companies. You can't get that out of stocks and shares, and you can't get that out of, uh, real estate, you get that out of people. Yeah, I, I love the concept there. And what came to me was like, you developed an expertise in business. And I think sometimes, and that, and that's where you invest, right? So you developed an expertise. That's what you're most knowledgeable of. So that's where you put place your investment dollars. And uh, sometimes you get these uh, financial teachers that teach you do it this way. But really, there's like dozens of ways to become a millionaire or to build wealth. You just have to develop an expertise in one and continue to invest in yourself and grow in yourself. And, you know, obviously you said you mentioned uh, you have created 18 liquid millionaires, you know, over time. Um, so they're learning from you. So you, be, you have become essentially what I call a money mentor for them with a business expertise. And yeah. so they're investing in their business. You're, you're teaching them and leading them along the way, just like, uh, you know, some of my previous callers or uh, guests on the show had an expertise. Uh, Robert Kiyosaki, probably a name a lot of you listeners know about. Uh, he's he's an author of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And uh, he really invests only in three things, but he, he teaches real estate investing. That's his big deal. But also uh, gold, silver, and Bitcoin. So he only invests in those three. He doesn't really put money in stocks. Uh, at least I've heard that he doesn't. And so that's his expertise. That's where he puts his money, where he's most comfortable with. So, uh, which is really cool. So Dean, you got this class you're doing for, for small businesses and stuff. Do you already have that out in the market or are you developing it right now? Well, we've just, we've just um, launched the, the, the websites going up and, and the ability to, to register and go on the courses. I've just been hit up by so many, I joined said Clubhouse and I was pulled up to a stage, asked to speak. Then I've been pulled up so many times and now moderating a few rooms and, and just giving value. And, and so many people would hit me up on Instagram where it was just a private family account with you know, about a hundred followers. Um, and, and that's, I don't know what it is, it's six, 700. And I've only been on there a very short period of time, but these people are hitting me up and following me and sending me DMs saying, how can I get involved in mentoring? How can I get involved in this? Um, and, it, and it's, so I've got, I've got everything I've been doing but, but it's me. So I would always be talking to you as a business owner, going through your processes, finding out where you are, going through your, you know, your finances, looking at your total, total addressable market, your obtainable, your serviceable. And we would break that down and, and, and kind of reach out. And a lot of the businesses I go in, I find they're doing too many things. And I was like, right, okay, but you're making all that money in there. 
and you're wasting all that money over there doing something that's probably not going to bring the return but sounds sexy if you put that effort into that you'd, you'd be you'd be 20x 100x uh, you know, none of this 10x. We, you know, we we want 100x every time because for every pound you put in your business, you 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 want 100 times back. Right? That's the, that's the way I look at it. For every pound of investment, so you've got to be doing things where you're an inch wide, mile deep, and then you can expand. Once you've got that, and you've got that, and you've got traction, momentum, and that kind of process where it keeps working for itself because you've really nailed those processes down, you can go left or right, and you can you can start to start to build out. So. We're breaking that down. Some of it's quite easy because it's, it's easy stuff at the beginning. For those, uh, we're doing we're videos like once a week, giving them, defining their business for the week, giving them some motivation, um, just, just making sure they're looking at key factors and they'll get worksheets with that as well. And then we, we're going to have masterclass as well, which is going to be um, online mentoring as well. We're going we're gonna to have touch points. We're going to do sprints on certain things. And there'll be one for startup, one for scale up, and one for exit, because if anybody wants to know how to prepare for exit for sale of their business, and I always like to tell people to prepare to be bought and not sold. If you're being bought, someone will pay a lot more for you than if you're being sold, because they've seen you, they want you, the emotions there, because if you sell to the heart, the wallet will follow, and they've already had an emotional tag with you because you're what they want. To do that, you need to feed the market, and you need to feed the market with the right information, but just enough so it's a hook. So, and you're just dropping, and the first time they knock on your door, you say, no, 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 we're not ready yet because our growth plans are there. And it makes them even more interested. You know, that, you know treat, treat them mean, keep them keen. They, they, they really want to know more about that story. So we're going to break that down and help businesses go on that journey. Yeah. I'm actually in my first angel investment group. Uh, I put a hundred thousand dollars in. Uh, it's been, uh, let's see, I think it's been about two years now and it's, I have to check where it's at, but it, it was up about 50% after a year. And then should be, they've shut down uh, investors at my level. And now they're only taking larger institutional type investors, but they've been in talks with like Amazon, Walgreens, and it's a medical tech company. So I'm pretty excited about what may return out of that first angel investment group that I've, I've connected with. But Dean, thanks for being on the show today, man. How are people going to find you, get information and plug into what you're doing? Um, they can find me on LinkedIn, find me on Instagram. Um, I'm under Dean Kelly, but on my new website that's going up, it's Deanism, D E A N I S M dot club, because we're going to be a club. We're going to be somewhere where they don't just learn from me, they learn from their peers, and they get that kind of virtuous cycle of, of, of organic learning all the time. Well, that sounds wonderful. I may have to check that out myself since I'm a, I'm not, I'm not at the Dean level of success with, with entrepreneurship yet. So I've got to work on that, but I hope to be there one day, Dean. Uh, no, no, I'm sure you will be. You've got the knowledge. So be good. And yeah, and please check it out and, and, and see what you think. Any feedback would be great because it's just gone up a few little changes to go on there, but we're just setting the courses and we're going to start hopefully launch those from March. I've got, I've got uh, already a, quite a big list of people that, want to be involved in that which is really really good so I know, I know there's a market for it and i know people are interested as well which is great yeah well i look forward to seeing it and have a great day yeah you too thank you thank you for your time the millionaire choice show shares the opinions and experiences of people and should not be considered financial advice before making your own financial choices please seek out a registered financial advisor or certified financial planner 